Uh, hello everyone, uh, welcome to Claudia's uh, final seminar. I'm going to take my mask off for uh, the introductions. Uh, my name is Lorraine Van Kirchhoff, I'm the lecturer here at the, uh, the Fenner School uh, and it's been one of my great pleasures over the past few years to have been Claudia's uh, supervisor. So I have the, uh, the lovely duty of introducing the final seminar presentation, which is always a very exciting and important milestone uh, in the journey of a PhD. Um, my sort of reflections as I was thinking about this uh, earlier today was also that it, in some respects it feels like longer because Claudia joined us prior to starting her PhD and working in the Conservation Futures Project and uh, the work that she did in that project was so integral to the, the success of uh, certainly where we got to uh, at the project level before she even started on her PhD. It was really exciting for all of us when she decided and took the, the step to continue her work that, uh, that started within that project, thinking about futures and what they mean for uh, conservation in particular, uh, and how we might take the next steps uh, theoretically and practically in integrating futures and, and futures ideas uh, into uh, to conservation, conservation planning. Um, it's not been an easy journey if you think about the timing of a PhD that's run sort of right through from pre-COVID to, uh, to where we are now. Um, Claudia was very uh, fortunate and uh, sensible in making sure she got a little bit of field work in uh, prior to, uh, to things really uh, closing down uh, and the, uh, the benefits of that I'm sure you will see today. Uh, but also been very adaptable, given the changing circumstances, what's possible, what's not possible, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, flexibility has been the name of the game and Claudia has demonstrated really, really admirable flexibility, not only logistically, but in how she's thinking about the project uh, and the research to enable her to uh, to get to the, the point that she's at today. I'm not going to preempt the content of all that. <laughs> Claudia, tell this story uh, and give it to you. Thank you all for joining us. Claudia's going to speak for roughly 40 minutes and there'll be time for questions at the end. So please do hold your questions uh, until then and we'll uh, field them at the end. Claudia. Thank you, Nareh. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today, even in this wet day. And thank you to the people on Zoom. And yeah, as, as Lorraine was mentioning, uh, this PhD started even before the PhD when we were working on the Conservation Futures Project. And I still remember the day Lorraine asked me, oh, why don't you, instead of coming back to Colombia, why don't you stay here and do a PhD with me? And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. all right. <laughs> Let's see what happens, but here we are, <laughs> close to the end. And yeah, this journey has not been just my journey. I have been very fortunate to do this uh, with the guidance and supervision of Murray, uh, the chair of panel, and Matt Koloff, Jamie Pitok, and Karina Wyborn that have been wonderful, wonderful supervisors through these years. I want to acknowledge the Nonawal and all Aboriginal groups as the original and first sovereign nations of the land we now call Australia. May their voices thrive so that future generations can continue to build connections with nature and with country. This research is influenced by my background on biological sciences and conservation. My life and my career choices have been framed by growing up in and being educated in Colombia, a biodiverse and multicultural country which rich nature has been promoted as one of our main assets and at the same time as the means to overcome poverty and achieve the size for economic development that is a legacy of the colonization in our region. So I see human life as totally interconnected with nature. That's why I have been very interested in understanding and document the dynamic links between humans and nature to find options to address the contradictory consequences of economic growth. I acknowledge the uneven and violent impacts of colonization on indigenous groups, especially and in general on the societies of the three countries uh, addressed in this research. Issues of racism, inequality, and dispossession have shaped societal relations and are still guiding decisions. This thesis is a biologist working in social science. So today I'm going to go through first introduce a little bit of what's the problem and why I'm um, talking about narratives of adaptation. 
then to move, explain what are the research questions or the underpinning this research. Um, I'm going to explain the methodology and methods used. Um, summarize a little bit of the case studies uh, before I can provide you a summary of, of findings and uh, at the end provide a little bit of the conclusions and, and key messages. So, of course, as the title says, this thesis is about narratives. It explores how language and words are used to communicate ideas and how those ideas translate into action. But narratives are not static. They change with time and adopt different words according with circumstances, with new learnings, and can have different interpretations at different levels. For example, the Global Goals for Sustainable Development, uh, or to address biodiversity loss, or to address uh, climate change impacts, are made under the assumption of a global common understanding of what is the problem and how are we going to solve it. But the reality can be very different at different scales, depending on the level of interest or even about the interpretation of the problem. Unprotected areas are an example of how these high level narratives influence decisions to conserve biodiversity and often ignoring uh, local voices, local practices, and what people want to do in those areas. This um, definition here in the, in the corner is exactly the definition copied from the Convention of Biological Diversity and the IUCN, but clearly defines, um, uh, defines protected areas that are clearly defined geographical space, recognized, dedicated, and managed through legal and or other effective means to achieve the long-term conservation of nature with associated ecosystem services and cultural values. So it is a quite high level definition of, of what a protected area is. But protected areas are actually complex social ecological systems where several stakeholders and institutions interact through multiple geographical scales. This graphic here is, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> is uh, explain this interaction at different scales from the protected area could be protecting some habitat patches or some systems here. But there is a lot of interaction at national, uh, through national scales and even international and national scales. These cross scale flows can represent information, can represent money, can represent ways of thinking. So it is a lot of interactions happening at different levels. Um, and so those interactions will imply trade-offs or feedbacks at different levels and will have implications for management and for planning. And as I said before, protected areas aim to be, uh, the management in protected areas aims to be long-term. But the policies, practices, and uh, allocation of resources is often short-term. That creates a disconnection between uh, management and ecological response time. This temporal disconnection uh, open questions about doing long-term conservation, um, especially as climate change and other drivers of change is, is, um, is challenging protected areas commitment to sustain certain values in the future. So this thesis study ways of conceptualizing adaptation to document, document different ways of thinking and doing biodiversity conservation under climate change. Um, I found the concept of temporal enclosures very helpful to understand and situate the problem of protected areas. Um, temporal enclosures are modern political processes that manipulate geographies uh, to appropriate some portions of land to control the resources therein. Uh, it also redefines the rights to use and access those, those areas, and also redefine the voices and participation uh, in, there through time. And in the case of protected areas, the future of the area is presented as something good, as something necessary, and it justified under on on conservation narratives. I present this image here that is, um, it's come from the Garden Root National Park in South Africa, that represents um, the multiple issues beyond the legal boundaries of a park. Uh, this, is going, this is one of the case studies in, in my research, and I'm going to come back to this to illustrate how this park is overcoming the temporal enclosures of, um, in, in this area in South Africa. Now let's move to the research questions. 
um, as my focus is on understanding individual in their interpretations about change and aspirations about adapting biodiversity to climate change, um, there are five research questions underlining this thesis uh, and the research goals. And the research questions cover some descriptive, analytical, and evaluative, evaluative questions, um, including the first question is, what are the narratives and visions of the future in, the, in, in each protected area? Uh, what are the narratives framing, uh, allowing, are these narratives framing, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> allowing or preventing climate adaptation? What is the current decision-making context for adaptation policies in conservation? How uncertainty is addressed in, in each place? And how much current narratives are facilitating uh, management changes? So I use a um, combination of approaches to examine these different conceptions, narratives, and framings using climate adaptation and conservation strategies. And these questions are uh, covered in the five papers that form this thesis by compilation. Now let's move on to the how and the concepts and, and methods used. Adaptation is about those actions that we can do today to respond to changes or to prepare for future changes. Thinking about the future has been deep seated in human societies in different ways, from the shamans and oracles to science fiction, for example, systems, cybernetics, complexity, emergence. There is a many, many terms related with what future thinking implies. But the systematic uh, about what the future implies. So. But the systematic study about the future is known as future research or future thinking. It is a transdisciplinary field of study uh, and related methods to help um, institutions and people to think strategically about the context they are, the problem they are facing, and encouraging constructive uh, changes in, in practices and thinking toward different futures. And in biodiversity conservation is then related with having the capacity to anticipate and accept future changes, future ecological transformations. That as, as, as accept those changes as something uh, that is normal in management, while allowing learning and critical reflection on the implications of ecological transformation in the future. Engaging in future-oriented conservation requires um, rethinking our assumptions about conservation goals and a critical examination um, about the impact of global change on those goals. And my engagement in futures thinking is through exploring futures consciousness. That is, uh, futures consciousness is the level of awareness of the consequences of decisions made today towards the future. Futures consciousness helps to understand individual and collective motivations that are influencing planning and how people communicate the future of conservation on the climate change. So the analytical framework for this thesis um, is based on the five dimensions of future consciousness, which considers some elements of social psychology um, and also takes some elements or uh, complemented, was complemented with theoretical perspectives of social change to understand how individuals and institutions are preparing for the future. Um, the five dimensions are first, time perspective is in this corner here. Uh, time perspective is about uh, our, how our, our understanding uh, about time influence planning and decision making, um, about having a long-term outlook and the capacity to understand and connect different temporal scales. Agency beliefs is the other one. Is the perceived ability uh, to influence and change current realities and being aware of change. Openness to alternatives is the capacity to think critically about the current context where we are, questioning established truths, and being able to appreciate the value of doing things differently. System perception is the capacity to understand the complex interconnection between nature and society, uh, social and natural systems, 
and being aware of the consequences of the decisions we are making today towards the future. So then if we have time perspective, we have the agency to influence the future. We are open-minded and uh, we have system perception. The question is, how are we going to use it? The last dimension is concern for others. It's uh, based on values, moral and ethical thinking, where future decisions are made uh, considering others. It invites to avoid just observing the development toward any future. To remember that our knowledge, our values, and decision contexts are evolving and changing all the time, and that we need to consider the welfare of future generations uh, to think about what kind of future do we want. These dimensions are not um, discrete or separate. They are all interconnected and are influencing each other. This table here summarizes the analytical approach and methods used to address the research questions um, in each, uh, and how it was addressed in each paper, uh, explaining the different methods for data collection and analysis, and also the different geographical scales that are covered in each paper. The papers uh, covers, uh, uh, explain the, how narratives are articulated um, and also explains um, future orientation elements. For uh, empirical data collection, I use uh, semi-structured interviews. And the questions uh, were focused on understanding how managers of protected areas and scientists collaborating with them conceptualize climate adaptation, calling the limitation of doing long-term conservation inside the static boundaries of a protected area. To try to elicit their perceptions about change, what outcomes do they expect uh, of implementing adaptation? And try to elicit what actions can help them to, they think they can help them to facilitate uh, conservation on the scenarios of global change. All the interviews were audio recorded and transcribed, and the transcriptions were coded for analysis using in view. Now I'm going to explain a little bit of the case studies where I did the research. The research design for data collection followed uh, multiple case study research. I look for case studies demonstrating some aspects of science, policy, and practice interaction. And I selected protected areas in Australia, Colombia, and South Africa. The three countries share some similarities, including a colonial past, having a rich and unique biodiversity, uh, have well-established protected area networks, Climate change has been identified as a major driver of, of change, and their economics uh, all rely on intensive coal mining industries. But the main difference, apart from the obvious geographical difference, is about legal obligations. Mandates to protect the environment and indigenous people are clearly defined in the Constitution of Colombia and South Africa. While Australia's Constitution does not provide mandates for uh, biodiversity or for indigenous people. In South Africa, I work with the South African National Parks, that is the national agency that manages uh, 19 protected areas in South Africa, uh, state protected areas. Um, the fieldwork there was in person, as Lorraine said before, it was the only one I was able to do in person pre-COVID. Um, and I worked there in the Garden Route National Park, uh, which is a very interesting park that is a matrix of different land uses, forest plantations and farms, and, and parts of uh, conservation areas. And all these matrix of land uses are managed as a single unit. I did 20 interviews there, uh, including people from the central, uh, regional, and local level, and also some people with the Department of Environment. Uh, in Australia, my case studies were Namaji and Kosciuszko National Parks in the Australian Alps. Um, here in Australia, I did 16, 16 interviews, uh, some online, some in, in person, that was COVID already going through our lives. Um, and I did interviews with people at the federal government um, and at state level with uh, New South Wales and ACT government. And in Colombia, I work with Parques Nacionales Naturales de Colombia, uh, which is the national agency in charge of managing 59 uh, national parks 
and also is in charge of coordinating with other stakeholders the integration of other conservation-based areas in the National Protected Areas Network. Uh, all the interviews with them were online. Um, I did 15 interviews at the different levels of management, and, and in, including people from three parts. Um, Otun Kimbaya in the Andes, Alto Fragua National Park in the Amazon, and Los Colorados in the Caribbean. That covers completely different geographic and climatic environmental um, issues. Now the findings. <laughs> As a thesis by compilation, uh, the results are presented in five papers. Although I'm not going to focus on, on to discuss each paper, but I'm going to try to provide a, an, overall, an overview of, of the findings. These papers um, illustrate how features consciousness elements come into play when defining a system or parts of a system uh, in management, and what are the implications for managing change or preventing change in protected areas, uh, and how the socio-political context influence adaptation options across the scale. Well, my findings demonstrate how individual values are influencing the understanding of adaptation and the acceptance of ecological change across temporal and across spatial scales, which also then influence choices for certain knowledge-based processes, and then it can influence defining adaptation. Actions to respond to change often respond to socially constructed discourses, which are then implemented through policies or strategies. From the interviews and the systematic review analysis, I found in general a lack of clarity about what adaptation is in, uh, in conservation. <laughs> um, there are multiple definitions and multiple approaches being used, but there is rarely a reflection about how those frames of reference are influencing um, important choices to respond to, to ecological transformation. For example, adaptation is commonly described as a cyclical approach and as actions to reduce harm and to build resilience. However, uh, those aspirations for building resilience and what resilience actually means in practice is often not properly discussed in management. For example, there is barely rarely people define what are the system boundaries or thresholds of change or about how social, social ecological systems are responding to change through time. The exception for this is South Africa, where South African national parks actively uh, use complexity and resilient thinking in their management approach. The systematic review and thematic analysis of academic literature uh, also reflects this conceptual variety of conceptual diversity in forming adaptation. I read 150 papers in this systematic review. From these 150 papers, only 36 provided a definition of adaptation, but I found 83 different themes across those definitions. All those um, explain the plurality of options and approaches. Um, in general, also, it demonstrates how people realize or think about the system. In some cases, uh, the majority of the papers are focusing more on adaptation of biophysical elements, and very few of them are uh, talking about uh, social and governance aspects of adaptation. The results also illustrate how environmental governance approaches uh, in each nations are linked with the specific beliefs and identities. Although each country has different discourses, they use similar metaphors to justify economic development. And in the three countries, there are major contradictions between aspirational goals for sustainability and economic development. Also in the implementation of environmental governance, uh, different scales, and how these aspirations for sustainability are matching the reality at the local level. Um, however, I found that in South Africa, South Africa and Colombia, uh, adaptation in protected areas is facilitated by having clear environmental governance and rules that are enabling managing, managers to negotiate agendas uh, at different scales and with different stakeholders. While in Australia, the lack of clarity in policies uh, to prepare for and to respond to climate change is a barrier for adaptation. 
The interviews demonstrate that the interpretation of adaptation is context-related. Um, I extracted a total of uh, nine narratives, three in each country. In gray at the bottom is um, the names I gave to, to each narrative. Um, these narratives are framed in a specific sociopolitical context and represent different aspirations for the future different priorities for managing biodiversity. Uh, for example, in some cases, like here we see, uh, there are more, some cases are more prioritizing social ecological systems or social benefits, while in other cases are more prioritizing uh, uh, adaptation in, of ecological attributes. Uh, there are also different understandings about ecological change and how to respond. Some are more reactive, others are more proactive. The rationale that is this graphic here to the left um, shows the connections and disconnections between mental representations of time, system responses to change, and management responses. Again, it is being more reactive or more proactive approaches. And the processes that is discussed to the right um, indicate to what degree adaptation approaches are empowering or disempowering managers and local communities and the level of acceptance of change. Some are more towards moving towards transformative adaptation while others are more towards resisting change. So this plot illustrate that when management allows the participation of other stakeholders, uh, it facilitates thinking differently about how social ecological values can be affected by drivers of change and, and think beyond the, the boundaries of the protected area. For example, South African Colombia narratives, that is the majority of them are encircled in, in green, are more systemic and more participatory and are influenced by sociopolitical discourses of social and environmental justice, not just the size for conserving biodiversity. While in Australia, the narratives are more inclined in protected treatment and species. I found evidence of how managers are rethinking the intention of conservation in the temporal enclosures of the protected area, and how the technical aspects of climate change, like models or scenarios, are becoming, is becoming less relevant in the thinking. This quote from South Africa illustrates how managers are questioning doing conservation and managing climate change inside the static boundaries of the protected area. They say, conservation cannot rely on protected areas. Conservation has to be outside of protected areas, and climate change adaptation cannot be in protected areas. This rethinking about conservation draws on existing relationships and negotiation processes with other stakeholders inside the protected area and also outside the, the boundaries of the protected area. As I said before, existing rules and the participatory approaches in, in, that are being used in South Africa and Colombia are enabling managers to pay more attention to the legal and institutional arrangements that can facilitate uh, dealing with changing climates and to negotiate agendas with other stakeholders, as seen in this example from Colombia. Our planning instrument must be harmonized with the local development plan, with the department, with the watershed plan, the protected area management plan. It's very complex, but climate change has been transversal to integrate those many planning instruments. So this thinking indicates elements of reflexivity uh, to rearticulate uh, existing pra practices and ways of thinking and doing and integrate other ways of knowing and other aspirations for the future. Empowering is about agency. Agency believes, explains how much individuals are confident to, they can influence future events. And agency is reflected in different actions and approaches uh, communicated by the interviewees, um, but also reflect desires for maintaining conditions or to accommodate change. Um, the results also indicate that managers are critically thinking about um, to what degree the institutional rules um, and mandates are contradicting what the park management wants to do in relation with adaptation and what elements of the system should be prioritized, and then uh, where those actions for adaptation should be implemented. In South Africa, they are clearly 
not scared about climate change. <laughs> that was something that was very surprising for me when I was doing interview there, and I was like, okay. <laughs> um, they say, we are not scared of climate change. We are preparing for it, and restoration is part of the climate change corridors. They are very confident that current uh, processes are enabling them to prepare for climate change, although they are also mentioning how rigid rules at the moment is uh, being a constraint to manage complex systems. In South Africa and Colombia, adaptation narratives that are, uh, they mention it a lot, uh, working landscape approaches and ecosystem-based approaches or corridors. Uh, these approaches draw from existing uh, territorial planning or watershed management regulations. Um, and that is really helping them to uh, include those, those institutional regulations in the planning and they are building on that to prepare for a, uh, prepare the adaptation uh, thinking in an implementation of adaptation in the parks. This quote from Colombia uh, is an example of how existing rules uh, is enabling agency and empower them to respond to change and to participate in different uh, cross-scale and cross-sectoral planning processes. We have been involved in the regional and subnational climate change nodes, supporting the implementation of the national climate change law also in the Colombia's 2030 nationally determined contribution, creating planning routes with the different organizations and the Ministry of Environment to see how the Amazon region can contribute. While in Australia, uh, there were negative perceptions of agency, and as mentioned before, because there is a lack of clarity on rules about how to prepare for change and also a perceived policy politicization, sorry, <laughs> politicization of climate change, or even about the contested uh, issues uh, related with uh, managing feral species. And that is, uh, has been clearly a barrier for adaptation in Australia. The results also indicate how mental representations of time uh, influence in understanding of system dynamics and how they prepare, um, in that case, how that influenced how they prepare and influence uh, and respond to ecological transformation. This means that in some cases, adaptation is reactive and short-term, responding to what I call calendar times. And in this case, in of Australia, for example, is responding to single programs that are focusing on managing some issues as managing feral species, although those programs uh, are not properly integrated in management. And they say they are quite concerned about that because they say the role of plants of management is changing. It used to guide everything, but now we go into program phase. The government wants outcomes. How do you get outcomes? Do you do it through a program? Well, this quote uh, from South Africa that was provided as an example of decisions to manage an estuary uh, was informed uh, by concerns from the local community about flooding. And it indicated that management and, and, and the scientific community in, involved in management is very aware of uh, ecological system responses through time when they make uh, management decisions and how they actually are foreseeing uh, future environmental responses to such actions. When we bridge estuaries, we are far more mindful of the variability within freshwater inflows. We have changed the way and the response time that we have to rainfall events before we make it a management action. We are doing it for the benefit of society, not necessarily for the benefit of the ecosystem. That is many things to question about that. <laughs> Implementing conservation actions uh, and expected outcomes of adaptation is also influenced through uh, the way managers interact every day in the park, the way they relate with nature and the way they relate with uh, other stakeholders and local communities. Um, when adaptation is described as a landscape approach, it means that they are engaging with other stakeholders and with local communities. In some cases, integrating uh, indigenous and local communities knowledge to better understand climate change in relation with uh, management and to include their perceptions about change in the, the way and, and what they actually, their communities want from the park in the future. 
This was mainly observed in, in South Africa and Colombia, especially the integration of local indigenous knowledge. Although in Australia, there are some, some things that demonstrate that this is starting to happen, not completely implemented at the moment, but at least there, there are indications of interest to include uh, more indigenous knowledge in management, especially in the ACT, as observed in this quote that um, indicates some desire for reconciliation and to allow reconnections with nature. A lot of the work in the Australian capital territory is actually about Aboriginal people finding their way back or getting an opportunity to be on country rather than them providing knowledge because a lot of it has been lost in the area. There's a lot of reflexivity there also and a lot of recognition the things that have happened in the, in the area. While the quote from South Africa was provided as an example of, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm doing the wrong thing. <laughs> the quote from South Africa illustrates the, the level of awareness uh, towards local communities' well being, which is facilitating them to reconcile social ecological systems with management. They are very concerned about climate, how climate change can affect uh, local communities the people and the benefits within the system. Should the system collapse because of climate change, what do people get? Nothing. What will happen the day when the river systems in the national parks that we manage are dry? There will be poverty, there will be hunger. So what are the implications of having different conceptions of adaptation? The main implication is related with how change is addressed in management, which means um, having a difficult but important conversation uh, to define how much change are we willing to accept and uh, because that will influence uh, the adaptation goals and the adaptation options that we are going to, to choose. And shifting this paradigm of long-term conservation in the enclosed boundaries of a protected area requires rethinking our assumptions of change, understand where, from where the motivations of doing conservation come from, what are the costs of sustaining adaptation, and the role of rules in shaping the decisions. And also, um, it will be important to critically think about the limits of adaptation. For example, those conservation goals that are looking at pre preventing change or preserve ecological integrity usually implement adaptation actions to maintain current objectives um, through reducing climate-related risk. But those actions that are most re mostly resisting change uh, and are aligned with incremental adaptation and short-term responses, at some point it could be that with climate change, uh, the ecological transformation of the park is still going to happen so they need to start thinking about transformation. It's something that is a difficult thing, uh, thing to realize for a national park, but it's, it's an important uh, reflection people uh, need to start thinking about. And then moving towards future-oriented approaches, again, require exploring where we are, what barriers and opportunities exist, and explore some necessary steps that we can do now to change current practices or, or rules. Um, the transitions here in this slide uh, were proposed to help managers uh, and practitioners to identify entry points to move towards future-oriented practices. I use these transitions here as an indicator of how future consciousness can enable reflexivity and transformative governance. governance and. Um, I apply this particularly and align this in the case of the Garden Route National Park in South Africa. In the Garden Route in South Africa, they use uh, participatory approaches with the local communities uh, at all levels to envision a collective future. They manage the park for social values, not just for ecological attributes. And there are high levels of reflexivity in how uh, South, South African national parks address management of natural, of natural resources, which indicate that they might be very well into transition to moving from ecological features to social benefits and transition forward from reactive problem solving to ongoing learning and reflexivity. And these transitions are facilitated by high levels of concern for others and openness to alternatives. And of course, the strong uh, feelings that they can actually change the current situation. 
There is also evidence that the park is moving towards transition three from the scientific and technical issue to, to uh, thinking more about the governance and management issues of managing climate change. As they are less aware of the technical aspects of climate change and more concerned about how existing rules are um, a constraint for managing complex systems on the climate change. And something interesting is that they have this very long term thinking about the park. Um, they accept the system dynamic and complexity that indicates that the park is also moving from resisting change towards anticipating and embrace change, the transition one. Their approaches, they already accept change. It's, change is something normal in management. However, future climate change impacts are not anticipated, not actively anticipated in the plan of management. And actually, for them, climate change is really like, what? <laughs> so <laughs> if the things can happen, and that's not our responsibility, uh, we don't need to do that in the park. But the thing is that if they are used to observe and document and learn as the systems are responding to change before they respond, um, this emphasizes the relevance of having systemic approaches and systemic thinking in future-oriented practices. Um, and then it's a question uh, that comes after this thinking that I have, would really love to discuss more with them. Um, is really that at some point, how much actively anticipating the future might not be relevant in the case of this park, because they are uh, the really long-term and systemic thinking they have. Um, make the climate change are not a pressing issue for them, and it's just about changing current uh, government approaches. And on there, we are <laughs> close to the end. So this research elaborates on how and which characteristics of future consciousness are involved in decision-making processes and reaffirm the relevance of examining how individuals mobilize and express desires for uh, change at broader scales. Exploring futures consciousness can encourage practitioners and scientists involved in management to critically examine their assumptions about change and how current practices are actually helping to manage protected areas. It can also help to unpack potential contradictions between individual and collective aspirations about the future. Um, and this transition towards future-oriented conservation can start through exploring where individuals um, and institutions are now, again, understanding the barriers and the opportunities they have. Uh, for example, uh, those uh, mm, approaches or the strategies that want to diversify knowledge systems to incorporate uh, other ways of knowing and doing in the practice, can I start checking whose values um, are guiding decisions. Is it more about managing social benefits or is it mainly about ecological features? So those kind of questions are things that people need to start thinking about. Uh, and this kind of uh, rethinking can allow participation of other stakeholders and allow the plurality in, in management and also start building constructive and respectful relations with local communities and indigenous communities. If that's the case of interest of diversifying knowledge systems in adaptation. And something very important is, again, the considering the consequences of decisions made today, it becomes fundamental in future-oriented practices. Future-oriented conservation is based on learning uh, from past experience and practice. It's based on reflexivity, should include new ways of thinking and doing, and accepting that change happens. And that even if change happens and some values of the past might be lost, that doesn't mean that the value is not relevant anymore. Um, so accepting that, that can help to uh, make relevant the part at different scales and at, for different people. But also important to consider that each protected area uh, have different contexts and managers are going to face different challenges and uh, different choices. So future-oriented strategies should be based and recognize the day-to-day -day management that's happening in the park um, and enable a reflection of what has been done before, what things have worked, what things haven't worked, and identify, identifying the process how to move forward. <clears throat> 
It also should um, consider that people mental models about assistance and the expectations about the future and the motivation behind actions are going to be different. So, and those kind of things are usually very influenced by social and cultural contexts that influence action and planning. So I propose that the, what the framework I use, the five dimensions of future consciousness provides a structure to understand these um, climate adaptation preferences um, while considering this diverse ontological and epistemological perspectives and relational approaches involved in managing protected areas. Um, the findings I suggest can inform the interaction science and management uh, in planning processes, especially through revisiting existing assumptions of conservation goals. And some areas of future research uh, can be to explore more the role of agency beliefs and openness to alternatives in enabling these transitions and to better understand how much uh, concern for others is enabling reconciliation processes or environmental justice approaches. And exploring the, um, how different models about time uh, influencing our understanding of adaptation. Is change something that we can manage at any time, or is it something that we need to prevent because it is threatening the world and the things we value there? Well, this has been four years. Uh, I have been working on the PhD a lot, but I also was able to contribute a little bit in other things. I did a little bit of casual teaching and tutoring, um, attended. Um, few conference and I did some seminars. I have been a reviewer in a few journals. I tried to share happiness when I was able to, I had time to make chocolate and participated as co-author of some other publications. Um, my PhD program was sponsored by the Australian government postgraduate and the Royal scholarship. I also want to thank you to everybody, every one of my um, panel uh, for all your help and support, patience during all this time, sharing coffees and <laughs> many stories that we have. Um, the research in South Africa uh, started actually uh, during a conversation in Cape Town with Mo Thomas Ubelele, which is the photo in the top. Um, a motto suggested me, why don't you do this research here? Um, oh, okay, that sounds good. And then Dear Cruz extended the invitation to work at the Garden Route, so all the magic happened to, to go to South Africa. And I'm very grateful with South African National Park with all the support uh, during this work. Uh, I also want to thank to all the interviewees in the three countries for the time and patience and sharing their stories with me. Um, in Colombia, I had the support by national, uh, national parks and Parques Nacionales Naturales, and also Herman Andrade, I want to recognize him. He was very uh, helpful uh, in discussing some ideas. Um, I also have been very fortunate to collaborate with the Transformative Adaptation Research Alliance, TARA. Um, I want to thank to Bruno, uh, Puria, Sandra, Enora, and all the TARA people in Australia and beyond. Uh, many of the conversations of, of the conversations about adaptation also happened through coffees and meetings with the adaptation get together meetings uh, with friends from CSIRO. Mike, Shona, Russell, thank you so much. Um, to all past and present panel friends, the list is very long. Thank you for being here at any moment and all the time you have been sharing with me, the occasional pint or a coffee or things that have been very, very good. I want to thanks to the panel professional staff, uh, to Rosie, <laughs> thank you, to Katie Liesinger and to all the people that are usually behind the, the scenes for there, the ones that make things happen in, um, in general and also to all the academic staff for conversations and chatting ideas at some point. Doing this thesis requires big amounts of coffee, <laughs> and I want to recognize Luke and the little people for the good coffee and the funny attempts to learn Spanish. <laughs> 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 to my friends and family here and abroad, and to David, thank you for your ongoing, unconditional, and multidimensional support. And to Chappie, co-opervisor-in-chief, 
That was all this very good in reminding me when to stop working. Thank you so much. In case the people on Zoom didn't hear, it's about uh, if any positive example from Australia, <laughs> actually. Oh, not necessarily. Yeah, the examples of demonstrating future oriented practices in Australia. Yes, there is. Um, there is, um, I think, especially in the ACT uh, region, is where there is more evidence of this transition of thinking um, being more proactive and accepting change. Uh, one of the things is in, in Australia, many of the actions are still very framed under the regulations that are very rigid and don't allow, um, even if they want to do landscape approaches, for example, many regulations are about managing trees and the species. So that creates a, a little bit of a, of a tension between what the park wants to do and what actually the regulations uh, allow. And also, uh, the ACT government wants to do a landscape approach, and I think they are actually doing it in, in, inside the ACT. But of course, when you go beyond the boundaries of the ACT government, that's the barriers that start constraining what uh, a landscape approach needs to be widespread and integrate different stakeholders that is happening inside the ACT region, but beyond the boundaries is very constrained. But I think it's happening. We have a question from online. Yeah. Um, and the question is, I'm just posting it in the chat so people can know what it is as well. It's from um, Maria Echeverri. <laughs> One major issue in the analysis of sociological systems is the representation of the institution or the government at different scales. During your research, were you able to determine if any specific position or arrangement of the institution within the governance system can move multi-actor conservation to engage in future consciousness? Thank you. Hello, Maya. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> um, that's uh, Maria Echeverria, calling from Colombia. Yes, um, you are right. Uh, the um, one thing is each context is different, and each country has very different governance arrangements. In the case of Colombia in particular, many of the future-oriented processes or future consciousness uh, things, uh, future-oriented processes, are uh, being enabled by the existing collaborative approaches that ex already exist in, in Colombia and the FINA, the National Environmental System. Sistema Nacional Ambiental, the National Environmental System, that allocate, integrate all, a lot of different stakeholders and provide the guidance of how uh, stakeholders can communicate and act. And that I know it's not perfect. Um, we in Colombia, we know it's, it's a lot of issues affecting the, the effectiveness of the of the SINA, but it, it really actually uh, allows that. One thing that is not happening probably in Colombia, in particular in Colombia, is the reflexivity. Is uh, inside institutional thinking inside parques nationales and the national parks is happening, but the integration with other stakeholders is a still still needs uh, to have more reflexivity to change current practices and current thinking. In Colombia, despite the size of uh, environmental justice and landscape approaches, there is also a lot of rules guiding uh, managing the species. So that's also part of the tensions between. Uh, changing rules and what people want to do. But I found evidence in uh, Parques Nacionales that they are trying to reconcile those uh, uh, ecological uh, managing the, the system in general as the social ecological system, reconciling that with uh, 
managing those threatened species or local species. So they are this is part of the transition that uh, people in Colombia are doing now. I'm not sure if I responded there. <laughs> Thank you. So, Claudia, first, I'd like to thank you for being an HDR representative for <laughs> several years. So thank you very much. You've helped us a lot uh, in the HDR program. And my question, and, and congratulations, and my question is um, you know, a few people have proposed that our protected area networks might have to shift, you know, you know physically. It's, it's usually biophysically, the thinking of it from a biophysical perspective. Uh, given their socio-ecological systems, as you said, um, is, that, is there anyone in the world who is seriously considering shifting their protected area network or at least components of it? Yes. Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, South Africa is precisely the best example I can provide. They are definitely shifting towards uh, and doing actively managing social ecological system, not just in the park I was researching, but uh, many of the management approaches that uh, the strategic, man strategic adaptive management thinking that some parks use come from rethinking of, of protecting the game reserves. As, uh, you know, the history of South Africa National Park started as protecting some animals for recreational purposes mainly. But those have been evolved through time and in, in the last, 20, 30 years probably, um, and they recognize the, the, how democratic has always that shift in thinking in, in, in about the system. Uh, it's more about the, the system. It's, uh, they stop managing, the, well, I cannot say they stop, they are in the transition, of changing the way of command and control the national parks towards integrating what people want, uh, social benefits of the park, and realizing that decisions they were before were not good. In, in Kruger National Park happened a lot when they were managing and calling elephants. And after realizing the, how uh, that was transforming the, the system and affecting the rivers and that they changed completely the practice. So I think South Africa is a very good example of managing social ecological system that, that that transition can actually happen. Uh, Claudia, and, uh, Thanks for bringing all the interesting things together. That's, that's really amazing. And I just have a question on the front uh, From the front from your perspective, and regarding your three case studies, do you think uh, any of them or all of them that needs more bottom up or top down only approach in the future? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, um, precisely, one of the uh, in the plot I was presenting before. If you see this plot, um, yeah, uh, South Africa and Colombia are the ones that are more towards participatory approaches that enabling, are enabling participation of local stakeholders in, in decision-making processes and in the park, South Africa especially. They collectively, uh, define the vision of the park. So it is something very participatory. Why uh, I think the majority of them are in between participatory and top-down or being more, more hierarchical. Um, one of the narratives in Australia that I called, call it the political dogmatism <laughs> uh, is very top-down, very hierarchical and it's about the rules saying what uh, should be done. Uh, for treating the species in particularly, and also considering that there is no clarity about how to respond to climate change. So it's very, it's very hierarchical in that sense in, in, in Australia. Um, in the narratives analysis, uh, that's why I say I, I identified map, map three narratives in each country. In each country, there is always one narrative that is very hierarchical. Um, in some cases, it's very about the institutions defining what to do. Um, in others, it's uh, more allowing the participation of, of, other, of other stakeholders. But, so yes, it's this mix. Um, I think, again, South Africa is, again, 
uh, the one that is probably moving more toward these participatory approaches. And Colombia is really trying to do that. It's, uh, each park is different also. The park in the Caribbean is, has been and, and the park in the Amazon region also. Um, they have been faced problems with the violence and the peace process, but after the peace process, now they are trying to integrate and uh, using the, the, the park as part of the reconciliation, as part of the negotiating with the stakeholders. So that is part of the recognizing also that the park cannot do anything by themselves in the future. And that if they don't integrate other people, the park is not going to be relevant. I think that we will need to close down the questions because we have read one of the clock. Please join me in uh, thank you.